killing the pathogen. Well, when the patient first presents to you with pneumonia, you don't know what the bug is causing that pneumonia. So we treat the patients initially with what we call empirical antibiotics, ones which will cover the common causes of pneumonia. And so to do that, we need to know what the common microbial causes of pneumonia are. And for the industrialized world, these are relatively similar across different countries. And they split down into about 20-25% of cases are just due to viruses. Influenza being the commonest one, but occasionally you get other viruses, rhinovirus, RSV, parainfluenza, etc. And adenovirus. And then three quarters of cases are due to bacteria. And th those bacteria can be divided into two categories. The pyogenic bacteria, the ones that cause a high inflammatory response, focal consolidation, generally speaking. The ones that re cause more acute and severe disease. And that's mainly Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is responsible for about half of all cases of community acquired pneumonia. But there are a couple other bacteria that occasionally come through. Haemophilus influenzae, Staphylococcus aureus being the commonest. Fortunately, gram-negative pneumonia is relatively rare. Atypical organisms cause a less aggressive disease, and those are mycoplasma and the chlamydiophilia, and occasionally Legionella, which is an exception in, in that it can actually cause severe disease, despite being part of the atypical category of organisms. An important point is that many patients will have a mixed infection, so they have a viral infection that allows the bacteria in, so they have a combination of influenza A and, say, a pneumococcal pneumonia. And the same thing happens with mycoplasma and, and chlamydiophilia that allows the bacteria in to cause an infection, uh, so you get a combination of an atypical organism plus Haemophilus staph aureus or Streptococcus pneumoniae. A very important point here is that actually when it comes to the treatment of pneumonia, we don't normally treat the viruses, the exception being influenza A, which we'll treat with the neuraminidase inhibitors, because there are no good antiviral agents for most of these viruses. But we do have to treat the bacteria. So it's a question of which antibiotics to use. I'll come back and discuss the antibiotics in a bit more detail in a subsequent slide. Now, we do do tests to identify what the pathogen is it causing pneumonia is. We actually limit these tests in general to patients presenting with moderate or severe disease, so are in hospital and have a reasonably high risk of mortality, 15% or more. And in these patients, we'll do a blood and, if possible, a sputum culture, although many patients are unable to produce sputums for this. We might do a viral nasopharyngeal aspirate to look for viruses such as influenza A. And there are two urine antigen tests that are useful in patients presenting pneumonia. One looks for pneumococcus and the other looks for Legionella. And so we may send those as well. And those both have about a sensitivity of about 70% for the bac those bacterial pathogens. The serology tests for viruses, mycoplasma, and chlamydophilia are actually not often particularly useful. And the reason why is that to actually get a positive result for serology, you need a matched sample when the patient's ill and three or four weeks later when they're recovering. So serology in general does not guide therapy because it's a, a, a post-disease diagnosis. The changes in serology only really tell you they've had that infection three or four weeks after they've got better. The last test I put down here is the HIV test. Now that doesn't tell you the organism that's causing the disease, but it's an important microbial test because HIV is an important risk factor for community acquired pneumonia. And patients with HIV will develop pneumococcal pneumonia at a much higher rate. Apparently, it's about 20 times the chance of non-HIV infected person. And that increase in the chance of getting pneumococcal pneumonia is unrelated to having a low CD4 count. So a pneumonia is an early marker of somebody with HIV infection before they've developed significant immune suppression according to the CD4 count. And therefore, an HIV test in any, in any situation where HIV may be relatively pre prevalent, an HIV test would be useful. So, antibiotics. You need to kill the invading pathogen. As I discussed before, it's the bacteria that we're really targeting. And the one that we really need to kill is pneumococcus, with some consideration for Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenzae, if somebody's particularly unwell. So, in general, we need, and sorry, we need to also to cover the atypical organisms, mycoplasma and, cl and chlamydiophilia. Now, the problem here is that the antibiotic that kills pneumococcus doesn't kill uh, chlamydiophilia and mycoplasma. 
necessarily. So the best antibiotic to use against pneumococcus is a penicillin such as amoxicillin. But that does not have any efficacy against chlamydophilia or mycoplasma. For those, we need a macrolide. So if somebody presents with mild disease, actually, we've got a little bit of room to maneuver. If the patient doesn't get better with one antibiotic, then we can swap to another. So in general, what we do in those situations is that we'll treat them with amoxicillin or clarifromycin and see how they go. And if they're not improving, then we'd actually need to think about swapping. And the normal situation there is that somebody will receive amoxicillin, but it turns out to be a mycoplasma infection. And the amoxicillin, as it doesn't kill mycoplasma, uh, the amoxicillin has no effect. And therefore, we swap to clarifromycin. Moderate disease, because the patient's in hospital, because the mortality is now reaching 15% or thereabouts in the curve 65 score of two or more, that's the definition of moderate disease, we'd like to make sure that we kill all the most likely pathogens. So amoxicillin is in, combined with a macrolide such as clifromycin so that we cover both the pneumococcus and the mycoplasma and the chlamydophilia in those circumstances. Severe disease, when patients are considered for intensive care and have really quite marked systemic upset and maybe uh, and have a high risk of, uh, of death, then we just need to be a little bit more careful. And we extend the cover to, of the, the moxicillin to coamoxiclav. And the reason why we do that is that coamoxiclav, augmentin is its trade name, has better activity against Staphylococcus aureus and some of the gram-negative bacteria that potentially could be causing infection in these circumstances. And because the patient's terribly ill, we don't have much room for manoeuvre. We don't have much chance of making a mistake here and then correcting it later on. So the cover for and potential pathogens needs to be extended accordingly. So in these circumstances, it's a combination of comoxiclav and a macrolide, such as clarifromycin. An important point here is that some of the unusual gram-negative pathogens that are very rarely found in community cardiomonia, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, are not covered by, this, by these treatments. And that needs to be thought about if the patient is not getting better. You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions, customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.